How many libraries do you think exist in New York City? <laughs> there are about 200, but I claim there are more than 8 million libraries in New York alone and 8 billion libraries globally. How come? Because each one of us is a library. Have you ever thought of yourself as a library? Being a library means being aware of the core text kept in each one of us. A private library is the sum of the most significant text we collect during our lives. This is our literary DNA. Look at the benefits of private libraries. They need no shelves, they don't gather dust, and the best part is, you don't have to worry about not getting back the books you loan. <laughs> Sometimes I hear comments like, we have all the libraries we need in our smartphones. But the idea of a private library is not about the access to texts. You may have a library in the palm of your hand, but you will not be a library in body and soul. As Haruki Murakami wrote, you live in your private library forever and ever. When I was five years old, I discovered reading. I remember how letters became words, words became phrases, and how, for the first time, I could read on my own. That book was Millie Goes to the Kindergarten, <laughs> a book that, I can assure you, never appeared in any list of great books. But to me, it was precious. I admired Millie. She was the queen of the kindergarten, and she was blonde. I mean, what else could anyone ask for? <laughs> Today I have other heroes, but this book represents an important point in time for me, my gateway to the world of reading. Today, I research the impact of reading as a formative experience, how it designs the way we think, how it develops our personality. I use reading as a bridge between people, as a means to overcome social gaps. When I work with young people, especially youth at risk, I ask them to recall stories that impress them. We read together and find out how the text is related to their lives. I don't tell them they have to read more. I invite them to be libraries. I live through literature. <laughs> Reading is an essential component of my life. It gives me a language to think by. It makes my feelings resonate. I will never throw away this tiny, worn book about Millie. When I was 15 years old, I bought a book with my own money for the first time. Improving teaching. <laughs> you know, a typical choice for any teenager. <laughs> I really disliked school those days. I thought it was alienating, and I was determined to establish a school for teachers. Today, I teach educators. In a way, improving teaching tells the story of my professional roots. Do you have books you would never give away? Books with sentimental value. All those books are part of your private library. Our literary DNA includes characters who move us in a special way. We identify with them. They show us something meaningful about life, about ourselves. One of my childhood role models was Jo. She knew how to transform reality to art and never gave up her identity as a writer. After years of using all kinds of excuses to avoid writing, I finally fulfilled my dream and became a writer. Even today, when I'm not a little woman anymore, I go back to little women to meet Joe. Do you have a Joe in your life? A character who accompanies you for years, 
someone fictional, and yet, for you, is totally real. Those characters hold your strengths. They remind you the true self you want to be. All those characters are part of your private library. Literary texts are actually everywhere. We encounter them in our studies, in ceremonies, in conversations we have. But only a few of them attract our attention. From the moment they hook us, they are well stored in our memory. We adopt them, and they become ours. After watching four weddings and a, weddings and a funeral, I looked up the poem Funeral Blues by W. H. Auden, quoted in this movie. I thought it was an accurate way to express the feeling that nothing will ever be the same after you lose someone you love. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood, for nothing now can ever come to any good. Is there a quote you go back to? Is there a poem you recite to yourself from time to time? All those texts are part of your private library. Here is the great power of private libraries. They create a true connection between people. I call it literary intimacy. <laughs> In her last years, my mother couldn't see well. Reading had become too hard for her. Once a week, I used to drive her to my home. We sat in the car, and I summarized for her novels I like. No matter how long the text was, the summary lasted 35 minutes, because this is the time it takes to travel from her house to mine. My mother loved our discussions, not just because of the scenes that came to life, but thanks to the intimate talk it created between us. As much as I can, I create opportunities for literary intimacy. When I teach, I ask my students to describe themselves through five significant texts. In this short journey into their private libraries, they discover their literary compass. They illuminate deep aspects of themselves, their love, the values they believe in. When I work with organizations, I help them to dedicate time for sharing private libraries. Like a literary gym. <laughs> you can work with a colleague for several years without really knowing him. But when someone invites you into his private library, the literary intimacy creates a new kind of a dialogue. What private libraries would you like to visit? There are so many libraries to explore, of leaders you appreciate, of your children, of the person who sits next to you. There are eight billion libraries out there, eight billion libraries to be inspired by, because each one of you is a library. Thank you. Thank you.